to this webinar on the implications of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. My name is Abdul Basit. I'm a research fellow at ICPVTR. ICPVTR is a specialist unit within the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. As you all know that Afghanistan historically has been the agent of change in South Asia. Arguably, history, geography, and the superpowers have never been kind to Afghanistan and vice versa. As another superpower that is the United States of America is withdrawing from Afghanistan, there are growing concerns about the political and security implications of this development in the two immediate regions, that is South and Central Asia. To discuss this and other relevant developments, we have an August panel of speakers with us today. Let me introduce them to you. I am very pleased to welcome our first speaker today, Mr. Ahmad Rashid, who is a renowned journalist and author of several books, including Taliban and Jihad, The Rise of Militant Islam in Central Asia and Descent into Chaos, the United States and the disaster in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Central Asia. Mr. Rashid has been covering wars in Afghanistan and conflicts in Central Asia and Pakistan since 1979. For over 20 years, he was a correspondent for the Far Eastern Economic Review, the Independent, and the Telegraph. Right now, he writes for BBC Online, the New York Times, and the Financial Times. We welcome you, sir. Our second speaker is Amin Saikal, who is adjunct professor of social sciences at University of Western Australia. Formerly, he was a distinguished professor of political science at the Australian National University. Prof. Amin Saikal is author of several books, including Iran Rising, The Survival and Future of the Islamic Republic, as well as Zone of Crisis, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, and Iraq. His uh, research publications have appeared in numerous international peer-reviewed journals, and he has also written op-eds for various reputable dailies and websites, including the New York Times, International Herald Tribune, the Wall Street Journals, and The Guardian. Our third and last speaker today is Dr. Shanti Maria D'Souza. She is the founder and president of Mantraya, an independent think tank based in India. She is also the visiting faculty and member of research and advisory committee at the Naval Wall College, Goa. Dr. Shanti's research in interests include politics of aid, developments, and security in Afghanistan, transition and prospects for long-term stabilization in Afghanistan, as well as counterinsurgency, terrorism, and violent extremism. She has written uh, in peer-reviewed research journals, including Small Wars and Insurgencies, Journal of Asian Security and International Affairs. Her most recent books include Countering Insurgencies and Violent Extremism in South and Southeast Asia, Afghanistan in Transition Beyond 2014, as well as Saving Afghanistan. With these welcome remarks, before I hand over the floor to my first speaker, just a request to our participant that please use the Zoom chat function that you can see at the bottom uh, to send your questions. Please keep your questions brief and to the point so we could accommodate the maximum number of questions. So with this, the floor is over to you, Mr. Ahmed, uh, for your initial remarks. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Is that all right? Yes, yes. Uh, um, the peace process in Afghanistan is, is, is bogged down at the moment. I'm going to look at who is to blame and what can be done to revitalize it. In February, an agreement between the Taliban and the US would have US withdraw its troops from the country in the first phase, while the Taliban would negotiate with the Afghan government in the second phase. The Afghan government even released 5,000 Taliban prisoners as a pledge of goodwill. But the Taliban have refused the main demand of the government and the international community, which is for a ceasefire. As the US began troop withdrawals in September, these talks have bogged down and Taliban attacks have intensified. The Taliban have refused to spell out its terms or conditions for a future power sharing arrangement. And still there is no sign that the Taliban accept democracy, the Afghan constitution, 
nor a ceasefire. The Taliban pledged to cut all ties with Afghanistan-based terrorists, such as Al-Qaeda, which the Taliban has protected in the past, has not been fulfilled. The UN Security Council Sanctions Committee maintained just recently that the Taliban still have close contacts with Al-Qaeda. The Taliban are also still protecting several Pakistani and Central Asian militant groups. The only group the Taliban is resisting is ISIS, because ISIS threatens Taliban hegemony in Afghanistan. The US estimates that there are some 2,000 ISIS fighters in Afghanistan. Nearly three months after the talks began, the two sides are still arguing over the agenda and the format of the talks. So who exactly is against the deal? On the Taliban side, some militant commanders would prefer to reconquer Afghanistan and unseat the government. While the older generation of Taliban has led the talks and prefer a settlement, younger and more militant commanders, some of whom have served time in Guantanamo, would prefer to fight on. In particular, the Haqqani group within the Taliban are known for their fanatical loyalty to Al-Qaeda and their desire to drive out all foreign forces. These elements are finding it quite easy to sabotage the talks. On the Kabul side, the warlords, drug, drug dealers, politicians, and others who make up the Afghan government are equally divided. While President Ashraf Ghani puts on a brave face to support the US Taliban agreement, his own vice president and other ministers say talks with the Taliban are a waste of time. Ghani has so far failed to build a consensus around the government's desire to continue talks. Meanwhile, the majority of urban educated Afghans, and in particular Afghan women, fear for the future and are mostly opposed to giving more concessions to the Taliban. Over the past year, the number of US soldiers has fallen by more than half, from over 9,000 to, to 4,500. Tr President Trump says he wants all troops home by Christmas. And President Biden is likely to follow suit, except he will listen more to the Pentagon's desire to stagger the withdrawal. The Taliban strategy appears to be that the longer the talks go on, the weaker the Afghan government and armed forces will become until there is a Vietnam-like collapse of the Afghan army. In the US, some Democrats and even some Republicans such as Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, oppose any talks with the Taliban. The strongest opposition to a hasty pullout has come from the Pentagon, from serving and retired officers. A former Trump National Security Advisor, General McMaster, has said, quote, what we've done is we've partnered with the Taliban against the Afghan government, close quote. Afghan government forces are in no condition to sustain an un indefinite Taliban offensive on major cities. <clears throat> in August, President Ghani admitted that in the preceding six months, over 12,000 soldiers, police, and civilians had been killed by the Taliban. There have been devastating attacks in Kabul and particularly on educational centers, killing scores of students in a bid to destroy the achievements of the government since 9-11, of which education is the key. The international community is equally divided and confused. The early enthusiasm for the, for the Doha talks shown by most countries, including an influential China, has waned. Iran, a key neighbor of Afghanistan, has been ignored by the Americans in, an, in, in including it in any discussion. India is reluctant to see any Taliban-led government. And Afghans are still deeply suspicious of Pakistan's true intentions and its relationship with extremists such as the Haqqani group, as long as the Taliban leadership continues to be based in Pakistan. Some Taliban may think that they have defeated America and the talks in Doha are just to negotiate the government surrender. Yet outright military victory for the Taliban is still far off. The Afghan army may be demoralized, but it is not yet defeated. The Taliban have failed to capture a major city, while the government has a new highly effective air force 
provided by the Americans. Trying to conquer major cities will be risky and bloody for the Taliban. I end by just a few comments on what can be done. The Taliban have refused a mediator, but to unlock these paralyzed talks, it is time that they accept outside mediation, perhaps from the UN or from any other nation state that is agreed upon. The Taliban need to accept a ceasefire in order to unlock the stalled talks, and they need to stop using continuous war as a diplomatic tool and pressure point. The Taliban need to accept that they are not popular to the majority of Afghans who remain intensely scared of them, particularly the religious and ethnic minorities. The government needs to do a better job of uniting the factions within it and protecting the major cities from attack. Above all, there has to be flexibility from both sides. The alternative is another civil war. Thank you. With this, we turn to our second speaker, uh, Prof. Amin Saikal. The floor is yours for your initial remarks. Thank you very much, Abu Basit. Um, I think uh, Mr. Ahmed Rashid has uh, comprehensively covered uh, a number of major points uh, which I was also going to address. Uh, and uh, so therefore, whatever I'm going to really say is going to overlap with uh, some of the issues that he's already raised. I mean, I think the US has reached a point of exhaustion in Afghanistan. President uh, Trump, a long-standing critic of America's Afghan adventure, has firmly acted to bring the boys home and extract the United States and its NATO allies from what has become a very costly and unwinnable war. The Taliban and their main backer, and I think it's pretty well known, the uh, Pakistan, have never been in a stronger position the way, uh, from where I see it. So where does this leave war-torn Afghanistan? The United States is now at the same juncture that it found itself in 1969 after six years of combat in Vietnam and that the Soviet Union also experienced following its decade long occupation of Afghanistan in the 1980s. The United States has badly wanted for a while to exit militarily from Afghanistan, but with some face saving measures intact. I mean, as uh, uh, Mr. Rashid pointed out, the uh, United States signed a bilateral peace agreement with its erstwhile enemy, the Taliban, last February, to facilitate a US and ally to troop withdrawal and also ostensibly opened the way to promote a political settlement between the warring Afghan parties as the best option, or alternatively, let the Afghan and regional actors determine the fate of Afghanistan. President Trump has shown no qualms over the elevation of the Taliban to the status of a US partner in peace. And prior to the November US elections, as an important step in aiding his prospects to win the pool. Nor has he cared how Afghanistan is governed and who governs it. After eight months of shuttle diplomacy and negotiations, the deal with the Taliban was the best that the self-confessed new conservative and US representative for Afghanistan's reconciliation, the Afghan-American Zalmay Khalizad could achieve. The United States acted in earnest by withdrawing, as also Mr. Rashid pointed out, some 5,300 troops out of a total of 14,000, and, uh, and Trump promised to pull out most of the remaining soldiers by the end of this year. However, the foundations for achieving a viable and lasting political settlements are very thin in Afghanistan. Many factors account for this, but it's important to be reminded of the most salient ones. The US Taliban peace agreement, as Mr. Rashid pointed out, does not provide for a ceasefire, nor does it conditionally oblige the Taliban to negotiate with other Afghan parties in good faith. It commits the United States and the Taliban to avoid fighting one another, 
but does not ask the Taliban to halt combating the Afghan national security forces. In fact, since the signing of the agreement, the Taliban have amplified their operations at the cost of more military and civilian casualties than in the preceding months. Although the Afghan and allied forces have also been responsible for some of the civilian losses. The Afghan national security forces is overstretched with an unprecedented level of loss and desertion. While maintaining the mirage of an inter-Afghan dialogue in Doha since 2nd of September, the Taliban has insisted on their agreement with the United States to form the basis of moving forward, stalling the talks to this date. This is not to claim that the disunity among the Afghan government-led delegation has not co contributed to the impasse either. Further, the Taliban are not the only armed opposition group in Afghanistan. There are many more, including, most importantly, the Khorasan branch of the Islamic State, or ISK, and, of course, Al-Qaeda. ISK, or the Islamic State of Khorasan, whose identity and composition remain quite obscure, has been responsible for some of the deadliest attacks across the country. This, uh, this group is rivals to the Taliban, and the Taliban have no control over it. Al-Qaeda is, uh, is also a force in Afghanistan. And as uh, Mr. Rashid pointed out, the US intelligence and UN sources have already confirmed this. For the United States to expect the Taliban to restrain the Islamic State or Al-Qaeda, or for that matter, some of its own splendor groups and criminal gangs that operate in Afghanistan is a mistake. Concurrently, the government Kabul is very weak, with red over no more than half of the country. It lacks a widely acceptable and nationally unifying leader. It has been wrecked by a kleptocratic, ethnicized, and entrepreneurial politics. President Ashraf Ghani, who was declared in February as the winner of the September 2019 presidential election, with less than 1 million votes in a country of some 37 million population. And that does not really provide the sort of a wide degree of popular and political legitimacy that a strong leader needs in that country. Neither this development nor the inadequacies of the government in serving the common good, especially in the wake of the COVID-19 savagery, has left much room for a majority of the Afghan people to have any trust in the government. Ghani has been struggling to give an impression that he is presiding over a coherent and effective government and over a national security forces capable of keeping the Taliban at bay for more than a few months in the absence of US and allied military and financial support. The Taliban have good reasons to abide their time for a bit longer until all foreign troops are withdrawn so that they can then make a decisive move for power. The United States Taliban deal has contained nothing to stop outside interference and support of different groups in Afghanistan in pursuit of conflicting interests. While Pakistan is the traditional backer of the Taliban, is keen to protect its interests against Iran and India, Iran has made a common cause with Russia uh, in an anti-US posture. Iran is also cognizant not to let Pakistan's close strategic links with Saudi Arabia enable uh, Saudi Arabia to secure an anti-Iranian leverage in Afghanistan. Perhaps not surprisingly, given the web of regional tensions and rivalries, all these actors, with the exception of India, have also been quoting the Taliban as a future key player in Afghanistan. The Afghanistan situation is so complicated that it would take a lot more than a US Taliban rapprochement to bring about a lasting and viable political settlement of the conflict. And 
for an honorable withdrawal, the US needs to leave behind a stable Afghanistan. An interlocking national and regional consensus is essential. This should involve a positive understanding with Russia and China as to what kind of functioning Afghanistan is, Afghan state could be nurtured that would have the necessary domestic and foreign policy capability to look after itself on the one hand and not be perceived as a threat to the neighborhood on the other. But it seems that, that a valuable opportunity is being missed. The Taliban are now better positioned than any other party to influence the future direction of Afghanistan, whatever that may turn out to be. The question is, what is Joe Biden administration likely to do? Let's not forget that Biden is as keen as, the, as Trump to make a military exit. But he can be expected to be cognizant of the advice by senior political figures and military personnel and seasoned analysts, as well as NATO Secretary General, that the withdrawal should be a responsible one. He favors a pullout that would not result in a unilateral Taliban takeover of power at the cost of Afghanistan being plunged into wider and deeper internal violence and turmoil, and possibly civil war, and US-led NATO's humiliation and 75 years of its history to the benefit of America's adversaries. The United States, the US withdrawal from a broken Iraq in 2011 must be a reminder that how that, that premature action helped generate conditions that enabled the emergence of the Islamic State, requiring the United States and its allies to go back to confront new challenges. Biden has wanted to avoid such a scenario, but only time will tell. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Cycle. With this, I give the floor to Dr. Shanti for her initial remarks. The floor is yours. Please unmute yourself, we can't hear you. Thank you for this opportunity and to join a very interesting discussion and a very timely discussion, given the fact that Afghanistan tends to be off the international radar many times. And I'm glad that we have a stellar panel here discussing a very key issue. And since the previous speakers have already sp spoken about the peace processes and the topic of discussion today is on US troop withdrawal and the implications, what it really means, I would like to play a little bit of a devil's advocate in looking at scenarios of what uh, US troop withdrawal would be, uh, given the fact that President uh, Trump made his announcements and the decisions had been made to cut down the number of troops and to bring it down to 2,500. Uh, and likely by next spring, most of the troops would be gone from Afghanistan. And even if they remained, it would be around 2,000, which would be a very, very small footprint for the US. And this, uh, like, scenario applies to the Biden presidency as well. So uh, given the fact that, you know, there is a very limited US footprint in Afghanistan, which could be either completely gone or very minimal, only for CT operation, it will make a considerable difference of looking at how the scenarios evolve. And it's important to look at the scenarios now, especially when you're talking about implications, because I think we need to assess whether uh, we have a situation where the Kabul government is either reeling from a failed or a failing peace process, or the Taliban have become the dominant political force by themselves. So we have to look at the scenario is from either a short term or a long term horizon to have uh, preparedness in terms of dealing with the situation as it evolves in Afghanistan. So if you look at the scenario per se of a US troop withdrawal, any kind of a precipitous US troop withdrawal would be disastrous for Afghanistan and the region, and we have already discussed this. And more importantly, what would it mean? It would mean a kind of an abandonment among the Afghans, and that will have a huge psychological impact. So if the US have to leave by next spring, or even retain a very limited force, it would play either ways. One is that with the peace process, there is a demand by the Taliban that the U.S. withdraws completely and retaining a little uh, limited number of troops will not help that situation. So it will not really end the war, but will drag the war on or drag the stalemate, which is actually occurring now. 
And secondly, if you look at uh, what the Taliban are doing, they're negotiating from a position of strength. So we really don't know what was the broad contours in terms of the secret annexes signed between the US and the Taliban. And uh, there are the limitations of having a peace deal which was externally mediated uh, and Afghan government being involved at a very later stage. So there are limitations of this peace processes because uh, there are issues within that which mainly we can discuss uh, in the uh, discussion. Now looking at the troop withdrawal per se, one is that the impact it would have inside Afghanistan. Uh, it would be hugely psychological because uh, like the 1990s, the Afghans would feel that the US has abandoned it again. And this would have a spiraling effect on a lot of issues. Uh, likely, uh, in most likely, what the international forces will follow the US in withdrawing. And we have heard this repeated talks of exit from Obama presidency and various countries exiting Afghanistan. So there has been that psychological fear of being left again, which has emboldened the Taliban and its allied groups. And we have discussed that. Now, looking at the intra-Afghan talks, if you look at it, little progress has been made you know, uh, from September. And uh, there are issues within this intra-Afghan talks per se. So despite all the efforts the international community will be taking, it will not be able to salvage a peace process, which is fundamentally not on a correct path. It's a, it's a very limited peace process, which was signed between US and the Taliban, and which did not involve a long-term vision. So Taliban is on a, a position of strength, and it is determined to have its Islamic emirate. So, and it will do through various steps, either through diplomacy or through guerrilla warfare. And Afghanistan's current political elites will remain disunited, unwilling or unable to pull together a common purpose, purpose even when the fate of the republic means, uh, is not really known. So if you look at the consequences per se of what this means, so by the end of this year with 2,500 troops left, the US footprint will already be very barely visible. And this will have a huge impact uh, in terms of um, uh, the battlefield dynamics in which the Taliban are demonstrating their position uh, given the current levels of violence in Afghanistan because even after signing the peace deal, the violence hasn't really uh, decreased. Uh, there has been no talk of ceasefire and it's not been really being implemented. So there is a climate of insecurity and fear. And this has actually created defections within Afghan security forces. It has fueled dissension with uh, dissent within the political circles and has uh, and has impressed upon the government uh, that you know the Taliban are able to take on territory. So this is having a, a huge psychological impact. And given that there is a battle of narratives of how much Taliban controls and how much the Afghan government uh, controls, uh, there is this whole advantage the Taliban is able to take uh, advantage of now. So if you look at the agreement of an interim government will be reached, such an agreement would raise very difficulties for, for the fact that the Afghan elite itself has not been united. There has been a lot of disunity and the Taliban have been taking advantage of that. So what will the Taliban do in this scenario if the US keeps talking about withdrawing troops, uh, mostly based on uh, its electoral needs or based on its constituency? The Taliban will keep talking uh, about the peace process until the departure of the foreign troops becomes a matter of fact. And only then it will start making serious attempt of breaching the ANDSF uh, uh, and taking on population centers. And under that pressure, the ANDSF may not be able to hold on to the territory, uh, territories it's been able to do so as of now. And that, again, depends on how much uh, of uh, air power the U.S. would use and retain uh, to help the ANDSF. So the Taliban are actually counting heavily on the path to victory being cleared by both military means and the implosion of the republic. So there is that huge tension between the Islamic Republic and the Emirate, which is going to play out because once they have the political domination, they are going to change the political sector as well. So it's not just the security sector, it's also the political sector. And as the fighting escalates, some Afghan power brokers sensing defeat may try to strike separate deals with the Taliban. And we have seen that. Uh, we have seen what uh, Gulbuddin Hekmatyar has been doing and other such uh, ethnic leaders will follow suit. So you will have uh, various Tazek, Uzbek, Hazwara commanders taking positions either to block the insurgents or to join them. And that will lead to the weakening of the Afghan government. And in addition to that, 
uh, smelling the success of the Taliban itself, the groups associated with it, like the Al-Qaeda, will be emboldened. And likely ISK will compete with Taliban and Al-Qaeda. And this is opening the space for more groups to join in in Afghanistan's already crowded uh, uh, terrorist uh, landscape. It would also result uh, importantly in terms of a flow of refugees, and that's just not the urban educated who leads first, but also the others. And this will be huge in terms of the numbers. A Taliban spokesman has le left little doubt that in the Emirate there would be retribution aimed at Afghans who are associated with the Republic's government. So the rapidly deteriorating economic situation and the security will lead in a matter of months to mass exodus or maybe up to 10 million people and with consequences for countries like Pakistan and Iran. Uh, international aid agencies and NGOs will likely cut down their programs and remaining foreign contractors will lead. And that will actually lead to a kind of economic contraction. What we are seeing uh, in terms of the economic bubble now will be seriously affected. And given the fact that Afghanistan continues to be dependent on aid, this will have a huge impact as well in terms of lack of opportunities and people joining these groups which are based in Afghanistan. So the level of insecurity across the country as in 1990s will create a constituency, uh, particularly in the rural areas, not out of choice, but more out of necessity to join the Taliban or, or as a way of ending the fighting. And that's what one of the reasons you find this battle fit, fitting already being demonstrated in Afghanistan that people want this bloodshed to end because they are on the receiving end. The elite can leave the country, but the common Afghans are taking the brunt of it. So needless to say, uh, in addition to all this, in terms of the peace process and the troop withdrawal, the social and economic gains, whatever little they have been achieved in two decades, will be in jeopardy. And for those who argue that societal changes that have occurred during these years would put a break on the Taliban attempt to dismantle advances, ignores the likelihood that the most of these have been championed gains will have been left. And also forget the Taliban's determination to put an Islamic stamp on the country. So a weakening Afghan state's political fabric and military position will hold important consequences for the country's regional relations uh, as well. Neighboring powers that until now have found a consensus about the desirability of a political solution will begin to revert on their hedging strategies. And when the regional countries start uh, hedging, then you'll see uh, more of a regional power play playing out. And all this at the end of it would mean that Afghanistan will revert back to what it was in the 1990s. And as the previous speakers have pointed out, a civil war or a collapse of Afghan state is not an unlikely scenario. So this is a stark situation we are looking at. So it's not one way or the other that you know a peace process would bring peace to Afghanistan or a US troop withdrawal will bring all the factions together and there will, a, there will be a peace a process and a peace deal which is useful to everybody and helpful to bring peace and stability in Afghanistan. That is more unlikely scenario in my assessment, but we can have this in the discussion since my time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shanti. Well, I'll be asking a couple of supplementary questions to keep the discussion going. I'll request our participants to please start sending their questions using the Zoom chat function. Uh, just as a counter argument, because it, it's a very gloomy picture that has come out. I mean, from the security point of view, uh, two linked but separate questions to uh, the speakers. One is related to Al-Qaeda. Now, the Trump administration and its various officials, they have spoken with contradictory or two opposing voices on the status of Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. For, his, for instance, Mike Pompeo, he and uh, the State Department has been uh, towing one line or pushing one line saying that Al-Qaeda has been reduced to its former, the former shadow of itself, uh, no longer able to mount attacks and uh, it is more of a, a movement unable to mount attacks as an organization. On the contrary, we have uh, uh, assessment coming out from the former national security advisor of the President Trump, uh, uh, General McMaster, saying that Al-Qaeda is alive and well and their connection and links with the Taliban are deeper than ever. In fact, prior to the... Uh, February U.S. Taliban deal, 
Taliban were continuously consulting with Al Qaeda. As a matter of fact, uh, they met Zawahiri in person to give him these assurances that the co cooperation will continue. So there are these two contradictory positions, and we have these recent killings of uh, uh, big Al Qaeda leaders in the region. One of them, Abu Muhammad Al Masri, he was killed in Tehran, Iran. Uh, then we have these rumors that Al Qaeda's chief uh, Ayman Al Zawahiri is perhaps dead. No confirm confirmation has come from Al Qaeda, but you know, no no one has refuted or denied this news so far. So with these killings and these two contradictory assessments coming out of the Trump administration's officials, what is the real status of Al Qaeda? Number one. Number two is about the Taliban. Now Taliban have so far struggled to take over any uh, provincial capital or a main city. Even as we talk, they are trying to take over Kandahar city center, but they have failed so far. So the battle dynamics are stalemated in a way that despite a tactical upper hand, uh, Taliban have struggled to take the cities. And I think cities will be the main battlefield when it comes to taking over militarily. If that is the case, then what should be done in terms of, you know, supporting the current Afghan government to keep the Taliban away from the city centers. Now, if you look historically, Dr. Najib, he was dependent on the Russian foreign aid for about 25%. On the contrary, the current government is dependent on foreign aid for about 75%. So how much foreign aid should the current government get uh, to, to stay in power? And how do you reflect on this development that despite a tactical upper hand in the battlefield, strategically, Taliban still do not have that military muscle to take over the cities? Do uh, uh, our panelists uh, reflect on this one by one, starting from Mr. Ahmad Rashid? Thank you. Um, I just want to say, you know, uh, we should understand the importance of Al-Qaeda. It doesn't mean that Al-Qaeda doesn't have to launch suicide attacks on targets in Kabul or kill American troops. Al-Qaeda is the godfather of all the militant groups, Pakistani, Central Asian, Chinese, who are living in Afghanistan, seeking shelter in Afghanistan, and pose a threat not just to America, but to all the regional countries. And uh, Al-Qaeda historically, has now become a kind of a, a, a godfather, um, a, a, a group that is, if you like, looking after training um, uh, and, and coordinating all these other groups. And it's Al-Qaeda is respected by all these other groups. So I think um, eliminating Al-Qaeda, which was one of the terms and conditions of the uh, agreement between the US and the Taliban, and which the Taliban have not implemented in any way, uh, and by the way, the, the Al-Qaeda leaders who've been killed um, in, in the last few months have been killed by the Americans. They have not been killed by the Taliban, nor have they been, uh, nor have Al-Qaeda militants been arrested or been put in jail by the Taliban or anything like that. So it's, it seems very doubtful that the Taliban are going to um, seriously address this issue of Al-Qaeda and other militants. Remember that all these militant groups now also provide manpower for the for the Taliban in their war um, to conquer uh, to conquer Kabul and other cities. So um, uh, we we are living in in a situation which is becoming more and more complex, but which is not seeing any decisive move by the Taliban to do away with uh, uh, these other groups. Prof. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to reinforce uh, what uh, Mr. Rashid said. And that uh, I mean, there's no question that, that um, the Taliban still uh, have uh, close cooperation with uh, uh, Al-Qaeda. And uh, uh, perhaps sometimes the presence of Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan is exaggerated. Uh, for uh, different purposes by different uh, actors in that uh, country, uh, but whenever it really suits them. Uh, but, um, but, uh, but my the point that I would like to really make that um, 
uh, Al Qaeda uh, will operate from behind the scenes and will uh, maintain connections with various groups and will provide them with a source of inspirations and indeed um, uh, to so that they can franchise their operations to the extent which is possible and would be uh, 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 considerable or at least uh, agreeable uh, to the changing uh, situations. Uh, and this is what Al-Qaeda has done in Afghanistan and will continue to do that in uh, uh, a number of of other uh, war zones or co zones of conflict in the region, and that of course includes uh, uh, Iraq, uh, um, uh, Syria, as well as uh, Yemen, and uh, to a uh, considerable extent even uh, Libya, and, uh, and so on. Uh, but the fact that why, for example, the Taliban has not been able to take over any major cities is because the Afghan security forces still receive a considerable amount of uh, uh, air coverage from the uh, American Air Force and that the American Air Force is very active in Afghanistan. And whenever there is a major attack, let's say, for example, on Kunduz in the north, which I have been a number of times, and the Taliban have been able to even occupy the center of the city, uh, at least uh, for a, sh a short time, uh, then the, uh, the American and Allied forces have come into action, and particularly the air forces played a very important role. And in the process, uh, of course, you know, a number of times the American air force uh, uh, bombardments resulted in the loss of many uh, civilians and uh, the, 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 uh, the different parts of Afghanistan. And, uh, and that has also made uh, uh, the, not only, for example, the Karzai government in the past very critical, but it's also been a major embarrassment for the, uh, uh, the unity government before uh, uh, the Ashraf Ghani's uh, ascendancy uh, to power as the president of the uh, country. Um, uh, uh, and uh, I, I think that once this, uh, if the American forces and the Allied forces are completely withdrawn and the American Air Force uh, is withdrawn from Afghanistan, it does not really provide the sort of cover that the Afghan armed forces uh, require, uh, then I think uh, the situation is, is likely to become quite dire. Um, I, and also whether the international aid is going to really flow to the extent which is absolutely necessary to maintain uh, the Kabul government and at the same time uh, to provide something like four to five billion dollars uh, in support of uh, retaining the Afghan uh, uh, security forces. I mean, at this point, uh, that's highly questionable. I think uh, once uh, the, uh, the, the, the United States and its allies withdraw all their forces from Afghanistan and the Taliban become more and more active, and even if the Ashraf Ghani government reaches some sort of accommodation or power sharing with the Taliban, uh, the, then the question will arise whether the international community will be pre prepared to to provide the support for a government in which the Taliban has a big share or the Taliban plays a very key role uh, because uh, the international community for a long time recognized the Taliban as a terrorist group and as the harborers of Al-Qaeda and so on. And particularly that, that there is you know, this uh, linkage that still exists between Al-Qaeda and uh, the Taliban. And that's going to make it uh, 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 politically and uh, ethically uh, very difficult for the international community to extend the, the type of aid or support that they have uh, uh, done uh, to Afghan government uh, up to this point. Dr. Shanti? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, I agree broadly with what the previous speakers have said. I think uh, the Taliban have been able, uh, not able to take on the population centers mostly because of the air power support. So my question is, in sense is that in case of a US troop withdrawal and no air power support, it would be likely that they would be targeting the population centers. And we see some signs of that, as Professor Cycle pointed out, in Kunduz. And that was instructive by itself. Now, looking at Al-Qaeda, uh, the presence itself, uh, we don't have a clear figure because I think that there's a tendency to undermine the numbers which suits certain countries' uh, interests. But broadly, I think U.S. Secretary of State mentioned that there are about 200 Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, but it could be more. Uh, the fact that there was this killing of this Al-Qaeda leaders, uh, Mohammed uh, Hanif and uh, Abdul Rauf, uh, itself uh, shows that the Al-Qaeda presence is very much there in Afghanistan, and the linkages between Taliban and Al-Qaeda are very much intact. And given the fact that uh, one of the conditions of the peace deal was that the Taliban snap linkages with Al-Qaeda has not really occurred. 
So thereby there is this huge concern of the Taliban al-Qaeda linkage. Uh, in addition to that, the Afghan government has repeatedly brought to notice that there are more than 20 uh, active terrorist groups operating from around the country, and that is a serious cause of concern. Now, in case, I mean, I just happened to see a question, and the question is about the U.S. troop uh, presence and the terrorist group's operation. If you look at what the IS did, uh, it did, after the vanquishment and the loss of Caliphate, it's looking at various theaters, and uh, one of the theaters was, it was Marawi. So likely, uh, in case of a precipitous troop withdrawal from Afghanistan, it's not improbable that IS finds some base and a territory in Afghanistan itself. So there wouldn't be an alignment between those groups in terms of cooperation. I think this is what Professor Kumar's question, and since it's linked to Al-Qaeda, it would be more of competition, and that would be even more bloodier. So that is the main concern. So if you look at uh, the Al-Qaeda connection and Al-Qaeda presence, it's very much there. So even a peace deal, our peace agreement is not helped snap that linkages. So where, uh, what does this peace mean for the Afghans, and what does it mean to the kind of Islam uh, terrorist groups which are operating in that country? So one of the questions that the panelists did ask, and because it is linked, so I want to go to that first, is about the coherence of the Taliban movement itself. There are these discussions that are they politically as coherent as they look apparently. Uh, uh, then there is also this question about the divisions between the younger and the older generation, Mullah uh, Ghani brother versus the son of uh, Mullah Umar, Mullah Yaqub, and Siraj Haqqani. Uh, uh, as well as between the military and the political commission. So going forward, if there is pressure on the Taliban from regional countries, say, to enter into some kind of negotiations, I mean, so vis-a-vis uh, -vis that, how do they balance the pressure of keeping their organization intact vis-a-vis -vis the regional pressure from different countries on which they are ha heavily dependent? So Pakistan is one, as Prof. Amin Cycle pointed out, they're also now depending on Iran, Russia, and to a certain extent, China, Qatar as well. Uh, so how do they, how do they really balance uh, these two uh, polar opposite uh, positions and how it affects their uh, internal, uh, you know, organizational structure? Very briefly, I mean, it's absolutely clear now that the Taliban are not going to um, give anything away in terms of what kind of government they want, uh, 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 what kind of relationship they can have with Kabul, etc. In other words, the Taliban are going to hold back from declaring any kind of um, uh, support for the constitution, for democracy, or for anything else. Um, uh, because, number one, they fear uh, the breakup of their own movement. Uh, a, a lot of their very militant uh, um, uh, rank and file would be extremely perturbed uh, if the Taliban were seen to be going slow on the whole Islamic factor. And they could desert the Taliban movement and join ISIS or join Al-Qaeda or join any one of the other groups. So the Taliban leadership is very much aware of how much can be lost if they come out openly in support of um, having a power sharing agreement uh, with uh, uh, the Kabul government. So I think, you know, that is really the crux of the issue. Now, obviously, we can't make progress until we know what the Taliban want. What kind of government do they want? What will satisfy them? Um, it's not good enough just to say we want an Islamic government, which is what they've said. So, um, just, sir, just to follow up on this, so they have demanded a religious council on top of the government as one of their demands to keep the intra-Afghan peace process going. Now, this is along the Iranian model of vilayat e -Faki. So that, in other words, means a Sunni version of Iran coming into Afghanistan. Do you really see that as viable? And that is, if, if the Kabul accedes to that demand, can that salvage the peace process, which is deadlocked, deadlocked right? I don't think Kabul can accept such a demand because it would also lead to the breakup of, of the, the Kabul government and, and what it stands for. And it would lose complete international uh, legitimacy and international support. So you have this incredibly difficult dilemma where the Taliban are too scared to admit what their, um, what their political aims are in reality. And secondly, the government is also very scared of um, 
dividing its own support base uh, between those who, who want to continue the war, those who want to talk peace with the Taliban. So it's an incredibly difficult thing. And that's why I urge both sides to accept some kind of mediation, because these two sides are not going to work out this, this conundrum and this uh, very chaotic situation without some uh, mediation, preferably from uh, the United Nations, backed by the international community, the Security Council, etc. cetera. Um, and you know, w without that, I think we, we will not see any progress. Um, I think if I could just uh, add um, a couple of things to what uh, Ahmad said. Uh, I mean, surprisingly, uh, the Taliban has presented a fairly united front up to this point. And they may continue to do so uh, when particularly compared that how the government side in Afghanistan is divided. Um, there is no question that there are certain elements within uh, the Taliban that who have defected, for example, to the Islamic states. And so there may be some splinter groups and so on. Uh, but so far, I see that they have uh, exhibited uh, more unity uh, than uh, one could really expect uh, from the, uh, their uh, 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 counterparts from inside uh, Afghanistan. I mean, the situation in Afghanistan overall is very, very fragile, and the government control uh, over the government, uh, the, the, even the territories uh, where it, uh, uh, it has jurisdiction. Uh, is uh, very uh, 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 very fragile. Um, I think uh, Ahmad's point about uh, that there is a need for mediation, uh, perhaps uh, by the United Nations or uh, another important source. I think the question is, I mean, who would be acceptable uh, to both sides as a mediator and who would be really effective as a mediator? Uh, this is, uh, uh, I mean, I, I, I mean, I don't think, for example, if uh, the United States uh, uh, would like to, uh, I mean, it's been trying to mediate between the two sides and it's been very unsuccessful. Uh, and uh, if, uh, for example, the European Union, uh, Union uh, European Union um, uh, mediates, uh, again, there's going to be a lot of uh, objections, but perhaps uh, at, uh, the Nordic states in, uh, in Europe uh, might be in a position uh, to provide a more impartial uh, mediation uh, and uh, perhaps it could be possibly uh, trusted uh, uh, by both, uh, both sides. Uh, but as long I think there is not a, a sufficient degree of national unity inside Afghanistan, uh, and uh, there is not uh, 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 in, enough non-interference on the part of Afghanistan's uh, neighbors into the, uh, the affairs of Afghanistan. Um, the, uh, I just cannot see how even uh, any uh, form of mediation uh, can really uh, produce uh, any tangible results. Um, I think what, what is really fundamentally uh, required is a, a stronger Afghan government uh, and that is going to take much longer than has been the case up to this point. And at the same time, I mean, as I pointed out, there has to be an interlocking national and regional and international consensus over Afghanistan. Because at the moment, there's not even regional consensus on Afghanistan. As has been pointed out, Iran has not been a party to any of the negotiations. And uh, uh, the Iranians would uh, love to really see uh, the back of the American forces and allied forces from Afghanistan. Um, but at the same time, they uh, want to be uh, in a position to preserve their own interests uh, uh, to, to, to whatever extent really possible. And of course, uh, Russia, is not really uh, been uh, wholehearted in the uh, uh, process of negotiations which have taken place and the uh, agreement which has taken place between the United States and the Taliban. So there is, a, 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 I think, many people inside Afghanistan, in, in, in fact, uh, in the region, uh, are convinced uh, that. Uh, uh, Pakistan and the Taliban are really winning in Afghanistan. In fact, they have been working towards this sort of objectives over a long period of time. And there is a very strong view inside Afghanistan that the Taliban is still, the Taliban delegation in Doha is very much guided and patronized by the 
focused on powerful military intelligence uh, and uh, were operating very much under influence of that uh, uh, of that uh, uh, organization and and also uh, there is a view that, uh, uh, that that's one of the main factors that perhaps the uh, Taliban have remained really quite united or at least presented a very united front after this point and they may continue to do so for some time to come Let me go to uh, some questions by the participants. So one question is... Can I just... Yes, yes please. Oh, sorry. Yes. sorry. Yeah, just very briefly, I think there's this whole uh, uh, lack of understanding about how the Taliban-led insurgency is functioning today, uh, given the fact that I think it's not the monolithic organization it was in the 1990s. And uh, so there is a difference between what this insurgency is today. It has huge conglomeration for a lot of groups associated with it with it, including the anti-government elements. So having said that, the fact that I think there is some kind of projected coherence and unified front by the Taliban, which surprises everybody, is the fact that they've clearly sent out a message to its cadres that they are going to establish the Islamic Emirate after two decades of fighting by driving away the infidels and the foreigners. So this is the narrative on which they are building and positioning their negotiating potential. So the whole bargaining strategy is based on the fact that they are driving the infidels away. And this narrative has worked very well. But there are divisions within the uh, Taliban which will play out on how the battleground dynamics and the power sharing or the political outcome of this battleground dynamics play out. For instance, if they're looking at a power sharing arrangement, that's not going to work for very long. So initially in the short term, they might agree to a power sharing, but gradually it will be a complete control of the state because without that, they will not be able to maintain hold on its uh, cadres and the fighters, which as pointed out before by the previous speakers would lead to defections to IS. So I think the fact that if you look at the each ceasefire, which was declared uh, a few uh, couple of years back and uh, how the Taliban cadres went out and met the common Afghans and uh, you know there was a lot of bonhomie between the people and the Taliban uh, foot soldiers. That worried the leadership a bit. So they, I don't think they wanted to get into ceasefire because then it would lead to defection and would mean a weakening of their position. So there is a coherence now, projected coherence, I would say, but there are differences within that. There, there are different shuras within the Taliban and uh, they, that divisions will play out as and how, how the power sharing or the ultimate political outcome of the battle, uh, battleground uh, dynamics play out. And any kind of U.S. troop withdrawal would lead to a situation where the Taliban will be in a position to dictate their terms. So it has to be a responsible and phased withdrawal, uh, depending on the conditions of the ground, depending on what the Afghans need. And as uh, without an FI, as you know, they could take the population centers in. Thank you. So one question is Prof, Prof Kumar is asking that, um, uh, is there a chance of a part struggle between the Taliban and other Islamist groups? particularly the Islamic State of Khurasan, or contrarily, once the U.S. withdraws from Afghanistan, are there any chances that these two groups can collaborate or the ideological differences are significant enough for these two groups to continue fighting? Uh, another uh, linked but separate question is about uh, the role of China in the post-U.S. Afghanistan. Can China fill the vacuum that U.S. is going to leave behind uh, uh, and and uh, uh, so one of our senior fellows, Raffaello, he's asking that uh, what the, you know, if United States continue to stay in Afghanistan, what is that going to achieve? Given the fact that in the last in 19 to 20 years, things have gone from bad to worse. Uh, yeah. If I, if I could just come in on that point, I mean, the, there's very little chance of cooperation between uh, the Al um, between the Taliban and uh, the Islamic State of Khorasan. Um, the Taliban do not want uh, such a group to come uh, on its turf and uh, try to secure a territorial base, or for that matter, um, any uh, having any share in the overall uh, power structure uh, in the country. I just cannot simply foresee that that 
there's going to be cooperation between them. Uh, if anything, I think uh, the, uh, the Islamic State will uh, continue its operation independent of the Taliban and perhaps in opposition uh, to just, uh, some of the Taliban's activities uh, in the country. And the Taliban will do everything possible to contain the Islamic State uh, but so far, uh, the T Taliban have not been, for example, successful simply because that they don't have control over uh, the all the territories of Afghanistan, and they they make uh, they 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 are only controlling uh, mainly the rural areas uh, in the country and not necessarily the urban centers. And the uh, uh, ISK has been very successful in uh, carrying out a number of uh, very deadly operations uh, in the country. On the issue on the issue of China, uh, let's not forget that that China is. Uh, very, uh, has got very close partnership with uh, Pakistan. I mean, the, uh, particularly that now the United States uh, is uh, doing everything possible to, to draft India into its uh, uh, orbit of alliance in one form or another uh, as part of this uh, Indo-Pacific buildup against uh, China. Uh, you cannot really expect uh, Beijing uh, to play altogether an impartial role and play an effective role in terms of bringing or, or creating the necessary conditions for a peace and stability uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, certainly it is uh, prepared to, to play uh, a role uh, from the margins uh, to the extent which is possible, but it's not going to be in any way at the cost of its uh, relationship uh, with Pakistan that is far more strategically important to Beijing than uh, uh, to, 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 uh, trying to uh, resolve the issue of Afghanistan, uh, which could uh, possibly uh, prove to be in one form or another uh, costly to Pakistan or Pakistan's regional interests. About the role of China, anyone wants to come in? Uh, if the US uh, leaves, uh, can China fill the vacuum? And how do our speakers see the role of China in Afghanistan? Yeah, if, if I may just say something. Um, yes. If you remember, uh, China, two years ago, China started playing a major role in trying to bolster uh, talks between the Taliban and the uh, Afghan government and, and the Americans, etc. And suddenly China's um, uh, uh, po political role was diminished. Uh, they opted out and they have not come back in any meaningful way. Now, one of the reasons for this was that I think they... Uh, insisted with the Taliban and with the Taliban's backers, Pakistan and others, that um, uh, uh, the, the, there should be a peace process as quickly as possible. And unfortunately, neither the Taliban nor the, the backers of the Taliban um, were prepared to accept uh, the Chinese analysis. Uh, the Chinese, if you recall, have already invested in Afghanistan. They've, they've bought up a uh, 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 a number of uh, uh, raw material uh, uh, mines and other things, uh, which they are, are not able to run effectively because of the war. And they want to exploit their, um, uh, their minerals and uh, other things that they have uh, invested in in Afghanistan. And um, uh, for that, they need peace and they need a peace process. And unfortunately, they were not obliged either by the Taliban nor by Pakistan or Iran or anyone else um, to, to really conscientiously go for a peace process. And the Chinese, I think, have become disappointed and have walked away from playing a major political role in trying to, to uh, go for a settlement. So um, I think still China is an incredibly important um, uh, factor. It can, uh, the whole future of Afghanistan rests on connectivity and trade and being a, a, a link between um, Central Asia and the Gulf. And uh, all, all this depends on uh, a peace, securing peace. And it seems that the Chinese analysis of the situation has not been accepted by any of the um, uh, belligerent side. And, and that has been really um, very, uh, a very negative factor which has uh, not helped the Chinese and of course has not helped bring peace uh, in Afghanistan. Let me just have a follow-up question on this. Uh, so a, a report emerged in the Financial Times uh, mentioning that 
Taliban have promised building, you know, highways, roads and bridges uh, to the Taliban. Uh, and they were talking to them on the sidelines of the intra-Afghan peace process in Doha that they wanted action against uh, the Uyghur militants, ETIM and other uh, Chinese militants in Afghanistan. Uh, and so, so they have this policy of, you know, having a parallel track, one with the government, the other with the belligerent or the insurgent groups. They have done the same uh, in Balochistan. They, they are with the military in Balochistan, but they, on the, the sidelines, they also reach out to these insurgent groups and give them a cut uh, in their projects just to ensure the security of their projects. That has been the Chinese template, in my opinion. How do you see that? I mean, they have been reaching out to the Taliban privately. Uh, is is that going to build any uh, rapport uh, uh, with the Taliban, or or uh, is it inconsequential? I think early on the Tal the Chinese thought that they could exploit their investments in in Afghanistan, especially the minerals, without necessarily going for a peace process. But I think very quickly they realized that they can't do anything. If you remember, I mean, the, especially the copper, uh, uh, the copper. Uh, the, Haji Gak. Haji Gak. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, uh, the, the entire Chinese staff ran away. Uh, they weren't prepared to, to stay there and under the conditions of um, perhaps having attacks from the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, etc. cetera. The, the Chinese do not want to get bogged down in any kind of war. And that means also not getting bogged down in any kind of uh, peace process, which can uh, endanger um, China's security or, or make it very difficult for China to operate them. They want, they want someone to deliver peace and uh, they don't want to do it themselves. And, and unfortunately, China's um, friends and allies in the region, in particular Iran and Pakistan, uh, don't seem willing at the moment uh, to go for the kind of long-term peace which China needs and wants. Okay. Um, if I may. Yes. Abdul, yeah, I think uh, broadly agree with the uh, assessments made, but as you rightly pointed out, I think for China, it's a security concern of the Yuga Muslims as well, and the economic objectives, so given that they have made investments and the investments are pretty much stuck in Afghanistan. So uh, if you remember when Taliban came to power, I think it, uh, the Chinese were the first to reach out and go and meet the Taliban leadership in 1996. And from then on, I think those contacts are still alive and they do intend playing a major uh, role in the peace process itself. But having hit a roadblock, they might not know what to do. So I think uh, the guess is <clears throat> they will outsource it to Pakistan and uh, let it let Pakistan dictate the terms of how uh, Afghanistan and Taliban uh, peace process evolve. But at the same time, given its economic interests, it will have some kind of deals with the Taliban occurring. So given the fact that it has invested in the Afghan security sector uh, and now it's looking at economic objectives, but also in terms of having that influence as U.S. withdraws or the troop withdrawal occurs, uh, it will depend on China uh, or Pakistan most likely. And that, I think, will mean that as the dynamics of the Indo-Pacific are playing out and India-U.S. are getting closer, you might see a better, greater alliance between China and Pakistan, and that could play out in Afghanistan as well. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, Abdul uh, can I make the point yes. that, um, I mean, can I make uh, the point that um, the United, even the Trump administration has said that uh, while they, would, uh, they will withdraw uh, most of the uh, American forces from Afghanistan, uh, they will still retain a relatively small force and a network of intelligence in the country to carry on the anti-terrorism operations to which the United States is committed uh, in the country. And my hunch at this point is that the uh, incoming uh, Biden, administ Biden administration uh, is likely to listen a lot more, uh, not only to the American uh, commanders on the ground, and to study the situation more closely on the ground, uh, but also to many uh, uh, critics of uh, uh, Trump's uh, policy approach to Afghanistan. And therefore, I doubt it very seriously uh, that uh, the Biden administration uh, will uh, not bring about certain changes uh, which could possibly um, 
uh, 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 block, if, uh, you know, if possible, uh, any uh, a strong uh, Chinese intrusion into Afghanistan, uh, 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 even if China uh, really wants to uh, get, get involved in the country. So I think um, we, we, we need to wait perhaps uh, uh, a little bit longer until the uh, Trump ad uh, Biden administration is taken over and to, to see uh, what uh, uh, sort of approach uh, it's going to really adopt um, uh, uh, to, uh, and how that is really going to affect uh, the overall situation uh, in Afghanistan and indeed the, the regional involvement in the country. Can let me just can, can I just say something? Um, yes, yes, yes. Very quickly. Um, look, look. China, I think, is 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 has secured its domestic stability in the sense that by jailing hundreds of thousands of Uyghurs um, and the fact that there has not been any ETIM attack in recent months and I would say probably years, uh, ETIM seems to have been crushed. The Uyghurs seem to have been put under control. So China is not worried now about a security crisis emanating from Afghanistan or from uh, the former Soviet uh, Central Asia. Um, I think it's, it's in, and uh, thirdly, of course, it's it's the fact that the Muslim world has not reacted to the um, clampdown uh, against the Uyghurs has also given it a kind of confidence that we can do what we like. Um, with the Muslim population in China, nobody's going to um, object or uh, anything like that. The second point I want to make is that there has been, uh, the, 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 the China-Pakistan relationship has met with some roadblocks and frustration. It's not been all smooth sailing as India would like to say that, you know, Pakistan is in bed with the Chinese and that they are um, all acting, cooperating together. I think China has been very frustrated by the failure of Pakistan and Iran to go for a peace settlement in Afghanistan. Um, and I think that that frustration we are seeing uh, work out because the the CPAC and all the investments in power, power stations and railways and roads that were supposed to come to Pakistan a year ago have suddenly slowed down. That, that those investments are not happening as fast as Pakistan would like. And I think there are political reasons for that. And I think one of the political reasons, not the whole re reason, is the uh, failure to, to uh, have a policy of uh, peacemaking in Afghanistan. So uh, I, I just want to point out uh, these two factors. So the, the whole China issue is very, very complex. And you, you know, you, um, uh, you can't, I think, make uh, uh, sweeping judgments on uh, ch China's position based on what it was doing a year ago or two years ago, because I think it's, uh, it's diplomacy, it's uh, geostrategic uh, thinking has it been evolving um, a, a lot recently, especially. So couple of questions lump, lumping them together now. So if, if the Taliban return to power and if they are in an ascendant position in Afghanistan, then what are the implications for India's strategic interest in the region? Particularly, how is this situation going to impact uh, the, the security situation and in, in, in Kashmir? Uh, one question is that Taliban do not have a political program. Uh, so in case they come to power, or if they join the government, how are they going to manage uh, the finances given that next year as America withdraws, the uh, international funding is going to you know, decrease uh, substantially. Uh, also, uh, what will be the implications for Central Asian militant groups? We haven't talked about this side uh, so far. Uh, so there are about five uh, uh, Central Asian militant groups in Afghanistan. What happens to them? Uh, uh, and the militancy in the region. Uh, uh, lastly, uh, which group is Pakistan going to support in future? Is it the Taliban, Al-Qaeda? Uh, uh, remember that Hikmat Yar recently visited Pakistan and he was given a high protocol and was taken around for, you know, delivering seminars, speeches, etc. Yes. Uh, 
I think we should ask Shanti first uh, to go yeah. on the India thing, you know. Uh, not really a spokesperson for the government of India, but I think uh, given the fact that I've been writing on this subject and researching a bit on what India's position has been, well, I think India <clears throat> has invested considerably in terms of uh, uh, achieving some kind of democratic uh, gains out of Afghanistan, and it will continue to do so. So if you look at India's position, it has been support for Afghan-led, Afghan-owned, and now Afghan-controlled peace negotiations. So if there is any kind of ascendancy of the Taliban uh, group in Afghanistan, what would it mean? Should India engage with the Taliban? Should India recognize the Taliban government? I think uh, when the, uh, such a situation arises, I mean, India would might deal with the Taliban as they are, uh, but it would in the meantime prevent such kind of a scenario because for the reasons that it has invested in last 19 years in a Afghan government, which is democratic, which has made progress which has impacted Afghanistan in terms of Afghans being uh, open to the outside world and reaching their potential. So India would actually first prevent a backslide. And if that doesn't occur, then I think if the Taliban were to come back in some form, India would deal with it as it comes because India has not been averse to dealing with the military junta in Myanmar or the military leadership in Pakistan or any other kinds of regimes. It's actually up to the Afghan people. If it's accepted by the Afghans and there is Afghan ownership, then it can be acceptable to Delhi. But anything which is imposed from outside, be it Taliban, uh, which is just placed there because the U.S. troop withdrawal occurred and there are backers and the regional proxies uh, having their own games being played out, then it would be problematic. And uh, just for your information, the Taliban have made outreach to India in numerous ways. And India has participated in various peace processes, uh, though not in a maximalistic way, but in a minimal form, it has maintained some contacts. So it's not really out of the scenario that, you know, the Taliban comes back and India won't know what to uh, do with it. But as I said before, it would try to prevent that kind of a situation. Now, if you look at uh, the question about Taliban and the international funding and how to get the funding, if you look at how the Taliban made uh, the outreach to the international community to get some kind of recognition during the COVID situation, uh, you, I think there are some lessons there of how Taliban knows to engage the international community in terms of diplomacy, in terms of getting some funding, because they allow the international community to have these programs in the regions they operate. So in that way, they're making themselves more acceptable and that kind of acceptability would help Taliban get some funding as they come to power. But that depends on the ultimate objective of the Taliban. So herein is the question. So are they going to come as in a power sharing arrangement where you have an interim government and you still have the democratic form of governance, or is it going to be an Islamic emirate? So it's obvious that if they come in totality and have an emirate, then the funding would be questionable unless they have other sponsors and backers who are ready to fund uh, and functioning of the government. So the question on the Central Asia, I think that again is important since uh, there are a number of groups operating and the fact that IMU is still active. And there remains uh, huge concerns about how these groups are going to be emboldened and how they're going to operate and those linkages are going to uh, strengthen these groups. These groups per se, if you look at the successes that Taliban are talking about, they're talking about an emirate and that's what all these groups want. So those kind of linkages would be strengthened and these groups would be emboldened. So Central Asia will definitely be affected. The slightly differ, uh, differ on what Mr. Rashid said about the Chinese strategy. I mean, it's not that it's just a thing that no one knows that China and Pakistan are quite close, but also the fact that China has independent contacts with the Taliban and which they are maintaining because uh, as I think Bassett pointed out, there is a dual track which the Chinese adopt. It's you know either this or that, it's hit or run kind of a thing. So there's no clarity of how they go about in doing their foreign policy. There's nothing stated about them. And given the pandemic situation and the COVID and the entire resetting and restructuring of the world order and the dynamics which are going to emerge out of them. I think there'll be a lot of uh, things uh, which are still unknown about how China will do. But my sense is that China, and uh, just for correction, it was not Hajikak, it was Messinak, where China has invested in the copper mine. And uh, even there was this whole talk of this railway track uh, 
from carrying goods from Afghanistan to China. So they've invested tremendously and they're not going to let it be a waste. And more importantly, as pointed out, the connectivity issue also is important because they would act, want access to the Middle East. So it depends on how China is going to uh, evolve uh, its strategy. And again, just to bring you back to the focus of what, how India and China are playing in Afghanistan, there was uh, in the Wuhan informal meet some kind of idea of working together in Afghanistan. But given the situation uh, we are in today with the border issue and all of this dynamics playing out, I think that's not going to occur. So it's obvious that China would depend more on Pakistan and India idea. would depend more on Yes, please. Just, just a linked question to this while you are at it. So one of the panelists, uh, sorry, participant is asking what should be India's role in the ongoing peace process, uh, given all the complexity which is there. So and do talk a bit on how it is going to affect Kashmir, given that one of the Al Qaeda of, uh, affiliates, Al Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent, changed the name of its magazine from uh, uh, you know, Nawai uh, Ghazwa uh, uh, from Nawai Afghan Jihad to Nawai Ghazwa Tul Hind, now saying that Kashmir is their main focus. Uh, do talk about that a bit and be a bit quick. We are running short of time. So, yes, please. <laughs> okay. In terms of the peace negotiation, as I said, uh, India has played a role as much as to strengthen the Afghan government to play its role. So what has really affected the peace process? If you look at the conflict resolution mechanisms and literature per se, or even in terms of counterinsurgency, you are there to strengthen the host government to do what it's supposed to do. So the peace process has started externally in Doha, negotiated by the US, and the U Afghan government kept out for most of it. Now that the Afghan government is involved, India supports the Afghan government initiatives. And as I said, it has uh, taken a position of taking uh, Afghan government position because it needs to be strengthened. They do, India wouldn't want a backsliding to occur. And that's why it's trying to prevent any kind of external interference or peace processes. And India will not take part in any of those external mediated peace processes. So unless it is uh, where Afghan government is involved and it's Afghan led and owned and controlled, India's position has been clear. So if the Afghan government wants the Taliban in some form, then I think India would support the process and be part of the process. Uh, but otherwise, no. Uh, the second question about uh, Kashmir per se, I think um, there will be consequences for Kashmir, but uh, given the fact that the present government has taken a lot of measures in terms of strengthening its own internal security mechanisms, uh, I don't think it will be much of a worry. The greater worry is that if these groups find a territorial base uh, and start operating for uh, Afghanistan or the border regions between Afghanistan and Pakistan and those ungoverned spaces, then I think it will be of, uh, it will have tremendous consequences in terms of security for the entire world. Okay. Mr. Ahmad, uh, your reflections on uh, Central Asian militant groups and what is going to happen there? Yeah, I, I, let, let me just say one thing. You know, you know when this started and I, I, people asked me for advice and things, I thought that the most important uh, leverage that, you, that the Americans and the NATO had with the Taliban was actually this issue of money and um, budgets and development. That if the Taliban were going to take control in some form in Kabul, they would need money. So that they, they needed to behave and accept some of the demands for democracy, et cetera, et cetera. What subsequently has emerged is that in fact, the Taliban are almost totally self-reliant. There is an extraordinary income that they have been able to generate in the last few years from drugs, from other, from hash, from other kind of uh, opiates, from marble, wood. They're, they're trading marble and wood with China. Um, uh, through uh, Xinjiang. Um, there's an enormous... Uh, so actually, the Taliban are not short of money. It seems that for, for, for their use... Remember, I mean, they are not going to set up universities and, and deal with uh, the health problem. They want enough money to operate their military machine, to keep that going and active, um, and to pay their fighters, etc. And that funding is actually probably more or less there already. Um, and it's not that the Taliban are going to be begging the West and the European Union for money, just as Ashraf Ghani has done in the last few days. We've seen that the European Union has pledged another $12 billion over, um, I think, over four years, uh, for, for in, in four years coming. So 
we have a very different situation now where the Taliban have really um, planted the seed of uh, the Taliban as businessmen, as investors, as uh, uh, even though many of the trade that they do, of course, in drugs and all, um, is illegal. As, as far as um, uh, India is concerned, I think the, the, whole, pro the whole problem is that uh, India has not really been a part of any of the international efforts so far to bring about peace. And uh, uh, India has warned everyone not to get involved with uh, any Pakistani initiative. Um, I think, you know, in, in India needs a more open attitude uh, towards Afghanistan. It needs a more helpful attitude. I don't think it can be dependent on, um, uh, you know, a, 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 a process of, of goodwill uh, coming from the Taliban and only then will India, in fact, uh, respond in some way. I think, you know, what what we need to see is, um, I'm sure the Taliban would like to see India get involved, even though Pakistan would be against it. Um, and a lot of Pakistan's efforts recently have been to try and make sure that the Indians don't get involved. Um, but as far as the Afghans uh, are concerned, uh, there has always been a relationship with India. And I'm sure even the Taliban would not want that relationship to be uh, undermined and destroyed. What uh, uh, your reflections on the Central Asian part uh, quickly because we are coming all well. The Central Asian groups are are very uh, uh, active in uh, in Afghanistan. I I think there has been um, uh, a lot of them have been driven out of Central Asia. Whatever, um, uh, uh, especially the militant groups. A lot of them are uh, have shelter in Afghanistan. They've been protected by the Taliban. They forge links with the Pakistani militant groups, with the Chinese militant groups, um, and, it's, and with Al-Qaeda, of course. And some have completely diverted and gone over to uh, ISIS. But uh, uh, broadly speaking, I think the, uh, uh, the militant groups you know, in Central Asia for the time being you know, have been tamed, have been minimized. Uh, uh, by by the uh, Americans, by others, etc., uh, and even by the Taliban, they've been kept under control by the Taliban, um, and we haven't seen uh, uh, that kind of uh, um, deployment of the Central Asian groups in, back into Central Asia. Um, so I, I I don't see this as it was a major threat a few years ago. I don't see it now as a major threat. Prof. Saitul. Uh, I think uh, too much has been made of the Afghan threat to Central Asia. I mean, uh, it has been uh, played up uh, uh, from time to time by authoritarian regimes in Central Asia for their own domestic purposes. Uh, and But we also know that the Taliban have established a relationship with some of the Central Asian republics, and uh, they have uh, given assurances that uh, uh, should they come to power or should they be part of a government in Afghanistan, that they will not be posing any threat to Central Asian uh, republics. Uh, and uh, one must not also forget that uh, uh, the Central Asian Republic, they take their cue from Moscow on, uh, as far as the uh, situation in Afghanistan is concerned. Uh, they will be very much uh, uh, in alliance with whatever uh, the Putin uh, government uh, uh, will say and do uh, in relation to uh, Afghanistan. But on the issue of uh, uh, foreign aid to the Taliban. I think Ahmad is right to say that uh, the Taliban uh, uh, have achieved uh, a degree of uh, financial self-sufficiency uh, uh, and they are able to uh, draw uh, on that uh, degree of uh, self-sufficiency in order to uh, strengthen their position and indeed uh, fund this, uh, some of their operations uh, in the country. But let's not forget that there are also other centers of power in Afghanistan. And they, they are also supported by different sources uh, financially and um, uh, materially. Uh, for example, you've got General Dostam. He's still got uh, whatever one thinks of him uh, uh, as a person and what he's really done in the past or me uh, do in 
in the future. I mean, he does uh, come on to considerable amount of following among uh, the Uzbeks in the north, and he is really uh, presides over a considerable amount of wealth. I mean, to so is uh, some of the other. Uh, uh, elements or a strong man in Afghanistan like Ato Muhammad. Uh, to, uh, I mean, c c currently they are all supporting the uh, peace process, but should they, uh, sh should it come to the point that they realize you know, that the Taliban uh, uh, will either uh, uh, come to power or, or uh, uh, t t take a big share uh, in the running of the country, uh, then I think you will see that these uh, 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 these uh, strong men, uh, I mean, including even uh, Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, uh, will, uh, will uh, do whatever really they can to, to protect their own uh, interests uh, in the country. And one other last point I think that needs to be made, uh, that uh, the, the issue of ethnicity in Afghanistan is very important, mm -hmm. tribalism and ethnicity. I mean, the Taliban uh, primarily come uh, from the Ghazai uh, ethnic Pashtuns, uh, whereas that, uh, uh, and of course the Ghazais had uh, uh, for a very short period uh, since the uh, 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 emergence of modern Afghanistan uh, in the middle of the 18th century uh, have been uh, uh, have ruled uh, Afghanistan, uh, but otherwise it had been their rival Durrani uh, uh, the tribe. Uh, which is a very uh, or particular group of that. Uh, Muhammad Zais have run Afghanistan or has had the political and military leadership of Afghanistan under their, their control for a long time. I mean, at the, uh, at the moment, the uh, Durrani's are relatively quiet, but let's not forget that Hamid Karzai is just sitting right across from Ashraf Ghani. And Ashraf Ghani comes from a, 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 a background, uh, and, and so is Gulbuddin Hekmatyar. So there may be a possibility of alliance between uh, the Ghazais but that will really run against the Durrani's uh, uh, interests as well as the non-Pashtun interests in Afghanistan. So I think the situation is very, very complex. It's very difficult at this point to be absolutely clear that what sort of Afghanistan may emerge after the American withdrawal and to what extent the, Amer the Biden administration uh, will uh, uh, react to the situation and to try to really prevent uh, at the, 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 the development of a scenario which could uh, wipe out the American interest in the region and uh, uh, provide a, a, a wider path uh, for America's adversaries uh, to strengthen their position uh, in the region. And that will include, I mean, at the moment, there is a close relationship developing uh, between China and the Islamic Republic of Iran. And of course, it, it, it has a very strong anti-American angle, at the, uh, I mean, there. And I think these uh, factors will always have to be really uh, looked at when we talk about to the uh, p possible uh, direction that Afghanistan may take. Okay, last two questions. One is about the lessons that, you know, countries were, which are engaged in counterterrorism, such as Indonesia is engaged with Jama Islamiya, what lessons they can learn from a policy point of view vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, you know, engaging in negotiations with the jihadist groups, number one. The last one is what will be an ideal case scenario, the most ideal scenario in Afghanistan uh, uh, regarding uh, the settlement, given that all scenarios discussed so far are not only complex, uh, but they rather look very gloomy. Yeah. Um. Can I just come out uh, yes. say something about the, the, the last question? Yeah. I. I think that uh, if uh, the Biden administration uh, does not uh, introduce uh, uh, new energy uh, in uh, American policy towards Afghanistan, in other words, you know, departing to some extent from what uh, Trump has pursued up to this point, uh, uh, to me, it appears that in the medium to long run, uh, Afghanistan faces the possibility of uh, civil war. And I think that is really going to plunge Afghanistan into another uh, phase of uh, uh, accelerated uh, violence uh, and uh, bloodshed. And in that sort of situation, you will, cannot expect Afghanistan's neighbors to get once again involved. Let's not forget that while uh, Afghanistan uh, is uh, promoted as a, uh, 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 as a center of connectivity, uh, 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 whatever really expires in, in Afghanistan, it affects 
its neighbors. And that is largely because of that Afghanistan uh, ethnic groups have extensive cross-border ties with Afghanistan's neighbors. And they, they, therefore, uh, the, the, the worst scenario that one can really think of, and, and that is a possibility, and that is a civil war uh, in Afghanistan. And once again, Afghanistan set back uh, to what it was prior to the American uh, intervention. And the best scenario is that yes, the uh, 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 Ashraf Ghani and uh, Gulbuddin Hekmatyar and uh, the Taliban leadership, they will take a uh, uh, lead and establish a Pashtunist government in Afghanistan. And of course, that has been shaping up to some extent already, uh, but that is not going to be really to the satisfaction of the non-Pashtuns in the country, and for that matter, the, the Durrani Pashtuns uh, in, the, in the country. Um, so, so you've got you've got one terrible scenario, and another one which is really half baked, which could possibly let Afghanistan uh, move uh, forward, uh, but uh, in, a, in a very, uh, uh, to some extent, in a very uncertain direction. Okay. Uh, what lessons do we learn from uh, the negotiations with the Taliban vis-a-vis -vis the other countries? Just some reflection on this and then we'll wrap up. Well, you know, I think, I think the, 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 these negotiations have to continue. Uh, <laughs> yes, all the scenarios are very grim and very depressing. And I, uh, e even uh, a, a means assessment that there, there could be a civil war in Afghanistan, I think has to be taken seriously. But even, it becomes even more important and imperative that uh, the Doha talks continue um, and that the next U.S. administration um, help them continue. Uh, I think that is really important. And likewise, for these groups who are emerging in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, and others, I think it's very important that governments do have a policy of dialogue. If there is any chink in the armor of these militant groups, and there's a possibility of some kind of dialogue, um, it should be taken. That doesn't mean that you give up uh, um, uh, police work and uh, 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 military efforts to disarm and to um, uh, uh, de demobilize the, some of these militant groups. But at the same time, if there's an opportunity for dialogue, it should be taken uh, very seriously. I think the extremist movement, if we look at what has happened with ISIS, in the Middle East, uh, we look at other uh, move. I think a lot of these militant groups are going through a very severe crisis um, over legitimacy, over their actions, um, over what, what strategies they should pursue, etc. And I think you know, government should be doing more to dialogue with some of these militant groups to reduce the tension. Okay. Dr. Shanti, any thoughts? Um, yes, please. Uh, I think um, when you're talking about counterterrorism strategy and the negotiating strategy with the Taliban, if there are any lessons for groups, especially in uh, Southeast Asia, I don't think really, because uh, if you look at the Afghan case, it's not that the Taliban has outwitted everyone. It's like Taliban is in a position of strength because it's projecting itself to be so. But so if you look at the entire uh, decade and half of, say, from 2001, the problem has been in Afghanistan, there have been too many actors involved and there has been no unified vision or a strategy in place. So initially during the Bush administration, it was counterterrorism, a very limited quick war, uh, finish the Taliban, get out, get into Iraq. So the, the golden period was lost. Then if you look at the period uh, during Obama presidency, then again, you have this whole debate about counterinsurgency and adding troops uh, and the troop surge debate. Uh, and there was a difference between the civil and the military uh, in, in the U.S. About, and Biden was one of those who didn't want troops in Afghanistan. So there was that internal debate which played out in Afghanistan. So broadly, if you look at it, you did have a troop search in Afghanistan at the time, which was important. But then again, President Obama announced exit. And that actually fed into the Taliban narrative that the Americans are going to leave and we are going to win this war. And from then on, they have been building. So when during Trump administration, he came back with his kinetic operations and a CT plus strategy, again, it didn't seem to work. So because there was no unified vision or an idea of what they want to achieve it as an end state, and thereby you deflected uh, towards a peace process and a peace deal, which was externally mediated. So this was cross-cutting. So neither the kinetic operations work well, 
or no, no, the uh, political strategy of dealing with the uh, insurgents work well. In classic counterinsurgency, or even in terms of conflict resolution, when you're talking to the insurgents, you talk from the position of strength. You have a certain agenda and you do talk about that, but that seems to be missing because the Afghan government was not involved initially. And now when it's involved, it's not strong enough. So for me, an ideal scenario now would be to retain troops to strengthen those institutions and uh, those mechanisms in Afghanistan so that this becomes an Afghan process rather than an externally mediated or an international effort. And uh, in addition to that, I think there was this talk of mediation. I think the UN has to really step up and play a more important role when it comes to Afghanistan. We really don't get a sense of what the UN is doing either in terms of mediation or moving towards peacekeeping operations to stop the fighting. I mean, without a declaration or end of violence, how do you even talk about peace and what are you going to achieve? Uh, peace at what price? People in Afghans are getting killed mercilessly. So I think there has to be a clear signal in terms of ceasefire and UN has to step in for this and mediation processes which have occurred and which need some kind of declaration from countries that they will not interfere in Afghanistan and stop doing what they're doing at this point of time. That would be an ideal scenario. And the worst case, is a scenario which has already been talked about is civil war situation uh, or a gradual uh, Taliban takeover, which is not improbable uh, if the US uh, troops uh, withdraw precipitously. Uh, I'm not arguing for US tro troops staying there endlessly, just to make myself clear, but the fact that this has to be a gradual transition and a responsible transition so that Afghans are capable of holding on the achievements they have achieved in the last 19 years. Thank you. I think it has been a very engaging uh, and fruitful discussion. Uh, uh, just my two cents to conclude, I think Afghanistan uh, is at a crossroads while uh, uh, as it came out in the discussion that the current situation is uh, fraught with many dangers, but there are some opportunities as well. What is important is that uh, one way or the other, the negotiation process has to continue. Uh, and uh, on the negotiation tables, uh, different uh, differences, uh, point of views, disputes should be resolved. Uh, uh, and and uh, there should be uh, a mediator uh, in the form of the UN uh, to bring down the level of violence and uh, you know push uh, the Taliban towards a reduction in violence and a ceasefire. If you hear uh, the discussions between the Americans and the Pakistanis, it is interesting that they keep on asking this question to each other, that who is going to be the peace guarantor? And the American side would tell, you know, you can't guarantee peace. It is just the process is beginning. And then the Pakistani worry then that is that, you know, so they, they believe that they will be scapegoated for the American failures in Afghanistan. So I think uh, 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 continued engagement and then some mediation has to come in uh, to correct the peace process. I, I conclude this webinar with these remarks and I'm really thankful to uh, our panelists, Mr. Ahmad Rashid, Prof. Amin Saikal, Dr. Shanti for joining us uh, and my apologies for uh, going a bit over time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.